Welcome back to Sonic Speed Reading. Today we're going to be covering the IDW miniseries Bad Guys. Yeah, the title is pretty straightforward. This is all about the naughty Nelly so far established in the IDW Sonic series. Just a bunch of rotten sons of guns. If you've not read it for yourself, I'm going to include a link in the description where you can go buy it on Comixology. I'm not sponsored, I'm just a fan. And if you are as well, be sure you support the creators. IDW Sonic, at least at the time of this video's publication is ongoing with writers and artists whose livelihood is directly attached to said comic. So if you haven't yet, go check out the talent on display. Always going to recommend you read the story for yourself, as opposed to just having some schmuck regurgitate to you on YouTube. But all that said, Mama Bird is going to take this comic and puke it right back up into your greedy mouths, my baby birds. <laughs> so Dr. Starline has been a very engaging secondary villain, as we've discussed a couple times up to this point in the series. So like the other popular new characters, Tangle and Whisper, we also got a mini series focused on the plotting platypus and and they also decided to throw in a couple of the other interesting new villains introduced in IDW like Rough and Tumble, Mimic, and... Zavik. It's very telling when the only game character has nowhere near the love compared to all these comic-born baddies. But no worries, this is IDW Zavik. He's much better here than his own source material, but we'll get into that later. I am getting a bit ahead of myself. Before any of that, we actually have to learn how these bad boys all group up. The story starts with Perry the Platypus here infiltrating Egg Base Sigma. And while he slinks around security, he's confident that Eggy was lazy enough not to do anything about Starline's personal login after the platypus was unceremoniously fired by the good doctor back on Angel Island. Starline, ironically enough, underestimates Eggman's thorough termination process, as his login does not work. And not only that, this incorrect password sets off an alarm. Eggy, I sincerely hope you never have a typo when you log in because that is a very severe reaction to an incorrect password. Can you imagine if that happened every time you try to log into Xvideo, I mean Twitter? The irony is not not lost on Starline, but the security is only three motobugs. But this does help establish Starline's new status quo, as he goes to use the warp topaz out of habit, but as we already know, that's no longer a part of his arsenal. But he does have an arsenal, and he shows off the first of his new toys by activating his electro spurs. I've said it before, but I'll keep saying it. I appreciate these newer characters coming in with abilities that look like they'd be fun to play with in a video game, and I always appreciate when they incorporate some abilities inspired by the real world animal. Platypus have venomous spurs, so Starline gets to use some spurs in a breakdance battle and goes all step up to colon the streets on these motobugs. But as every Sonic fan knows, the egg ponds are far too good at DDR, so Starline has to make a break for it. Later on we find him in his base, spinning a page talking to himself, explaining to us why he has his own egg ponds and motobugs even though he was just running away from them. And that's because he's amassed his own collection of Eggman tech over the years. He no longer has the Eggman Empire at his disposal, and worse still, the Warp Topaz, which he has spent a good chunk of his life studying and mastering, is now gone. So he needs new tools if he's ever going to accomplish anything. But what exactly is he trying to accomplish? You'd assume he'd want nothing to do with Eggman after he was served his pink slip, but he remains as loyal as ever, in his own twisted way. He believes Eggman has plateaued and won't ever reach his full potential while he obsesses over his battle battles with Sonic. Starline believes that he needs to end the cycle, ironically enough by involving himself in the cycle. But again, he can't do much of anything with his current resources. He needs help. He just needs partners that hate both Sonic and Eggman. And the duckbill doctor knows exactly where to find people who fit the, well, the bill. We shift scenes to Everhold Prison, blatantly shaped like a guitar. That's a lovely reference to the Sonic X version of Prison Island. And honestly, this whole book gives me SA2 dark story vibes which, yeah, that's a lot of fun. Starline busts into the Warden's office, where he shows off yet another new ability, Hypnosis, which is what I thought Starline's shtick would have been the first time I saw his design, considering all the spirals. That initial impression I had of him is probably why I'm fine with him having this tech. And again, this goes to show how diverse his tool set is going to become now that warping is out of the picture. This particular one will become more important down the road, but for right now, he uses this 
to convince the warden that he's here for a job interview, then coerces the puppy dog man to take him to the maximum security wing. It does feel like this ability comes out of nowhere, but so does a lot of other stuff in this world, so I'm not going to question it too hard. But that said, this is more in line with what I know his character to be. He's not a fighter. He isn't going to punch his way through a situation, but manipulating people and just walking right in like he owns a place? That's Starline. Still, the hypnosis has its limits. It works just well enough. His wit still needs to do the heavy lifting, as we see the warden come back to his senses, but still convinced that Starline is here for a job. And this is where we meet the rest of the crew. Mimic, uh, mimics the warden, trying to convince Starline that he, Mimic, is the real warden, displaying his abilities and in turn, his use to Starline. The Warden then walks the Doctor by rough and tumble, conveniently with their backs to the platypus. Otherwise, they'd certainly recognize Starline as he was the reason the two ever met Eggman to begin with. And this isn't the first time he's busted them out of prison. But he's not the only one that knows Starline, as they finally arrive at Zavik. And I love that the two just kind of glare at each other, this arrogant sneer on Starline's face. And the Warden warns the platypus to stay back, but Starline can't help but flex his knowledge on the Zeti, explaining that he controls robots with his electromagnetic pulse abilities. And that's why Starline is here to collect Big Red. And Zavik calls Starline out. But he's not too worried about it as he quickly puts the Warden to sleep. The Zeti asks why Starline even bothered to control the Deadly Six with the conch if he had that handy. And Starline answers by saying that he has a wide variety of tools that he uses when necessary. And besides, it probably wouldn't work on an iron will like Zavix. This not only answers the question of the Zeti, and uh, well, me as well, but also serves as a way to butter up Zavik with compliments. Starline then addresses the whole room, saying that he was used by Eggman just as they all were, and attempts to unite the rogues in their shared abandonment. And without surprise, they all staunchly refuse. But Starline's come prepared. I don't know why they refuse before they're let out of prison, but, you know, whatever. For Mimic, he offers to delete the octopus out of the egg net, which in turn should get Mimic off Eggman's shit list. If you recall from the Whisper and Tangle miniseries, Eggy is still after him for not fulfilling his contract and taking care of Whisper. But removing any digital trace of the cephalopod will go a long way to help him disappear. The skunks just want new weapons. No big surprise there. Zavik just flat out refuses, saying there's nothing Starline could offer that could make up for what the platypus put him through back during the metal virus. But Starline was prepared for this too. Platypus does not offer him a gift, but instead plays to the Zeti's ego, saying that Zavik should lead, not Starline. We then see that they both are, once again, plotting against each other. Starline believes Zavik to be a brute, someone who is easily manipulated, while the platypus would truly be in charge from the shadows. Zavik, of course, sees right through the charade, but goes along with it anyway. He's got to reunite with the rest of the six, and he can't very well do that from prison. So while he's not sure what Starline's up to, he's going to go along for the ride for now. But as they agree to work together, an alarm rings, set off by the now conscious warden. Starline incapacitates the guy with a neurotoxin spur, more in line with the real animal and, again, cool variety for the tool set here. So now it's breakout time. We get to see the bad guys flex their stuff. Mimic once again turns into the warden to trick the approaching guards. Then Starline once again uses his hypno glove, helping establish another limitation. Apparently it only works on one person at a time. But that's no problem as Zavik knocks out the other two guards that entered the room. But more continue to approach. And while they have their options, Zavik decides to hold back and let Rough and Tumble show their worth. And this is why I compare them more to Rocksteady and Bebop as opposed to Scratch and Grounder. While all of these duos are idiots, it's, they only look pathetic next to the heroes they fight. Against normal people, they still wreck house. And the skunks make quick work of this wave of enemies. And while it looks like they might be outnumbered, once Zavik joins in, it's pretty much game over. They wreck Wispins, start rolling through the place, making a mess, all the way to the control room. Starling goes to shut off the alarms, but Zavik tells him to hold back and instead unlock all the cells and scramble communications. This dude does not slink around. He is all about displays of power. And that's exactly what these dudes do. Prisoners escape, the place is on fire, and Starline's posse casually strolls out, their backs to the chaos. These bad guys are badasses. <laughs> and this is where part one ends. Our crew is assembled, and when working together, a force to be reckoned with.
But now that the crew is established, it's time to get things done. Starling has them reconvene at his base of operations, explaining that they need to attack an Eggman base that produces power cores. Now we've seen a lot of Sonic Heroes love so far in this series, but we're about to take it one step further. These cores are indeed the same you collected from that game. Starling explains them as concentrated energy used by Eggie's machines. And look, say what you want about the guy, but between these and the little critters he uses as batteries, Eggman's got some clean burning fuel sources. Now, even if you haven't played Heroes, you can probably guess what each core's color represents. Blue, of course, is speed energy. Red is power, and yellow is flight. They artificially amplify these users' physical abilities, and we get something of a measure for what it can do, as Starline says that the red one can double Zavik's strength. But what he doesn't explain to the group is that you can use these things willy-nilly. Just pick them up and you're good to go. What he instead tells them is that they need special adapters that harness only one core at a time, which he will be providing for the team. And he's doing this because he's hiding the fact that he's working on something specifically for himself. Mimic wants to know why they're even bothering with these things, as he doesn't see how it will bring them closer to his own goal. Condescendingly, Starlin explains that they will need the boost of the power cores to tackle their real target, an Eggnet hub. And that's pretty much what it sounds like. Eggman uses his own network to transfer data around his many bases and bots, which makes sense. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and clean burning little animals. Modern Eggman indeed. I do also want to point out because I am just glossing over it for story summary. The scene does a great job of establishing the dynamic between everybody. They are selfish, evil jerks, but they are fun to watch. Nobody, not even the idiot skunks, is one note. There's a chemistry here that will continue to build despite the fact that Starline is still scheming to double cross all of these guys. Not only is he risking himself by taking on Eggman, his allies are incredibly dangerous. If he slips up, he's a goner. But he weighs the risk of allowing any of these guys to live once he's done using them, pointing out that Mimic has done some horrific stuff just to save his own skin. Rough and Tumble, while idiots, are driven and can hold a grudge. They're easy to underestimate, and that can become a problem at the most inconvenient time. Not worth the risk. And Zavik, not only does he crave power, he knows how to use it. His action during the Metal Virus alone shows how capable he is, with or without his crew. And it must be said, they do work well as a unit. Starline set up the plan, Zavik working as a field leader, the rest of the team can rally around, Mimic confusing bots with his abilities, Rough and Tumble being absolute delights as always, and being capable bruisers in their own right. I love that they have their own tag team strategies, and a smoke screen, which yeah, that works, they're skunks. Man, even these guys look fun to play. I also like the slight hint of camaraderie between Zavik and Tumble, the two heaviest hitters of the crew. It's not much here, but they share a few scenes together and it's fun. Just a quick back and forth while they wait for Ruff and Mimic to wreck shop on the other side of the wall. But Zavik notices the door is held with a magnetic lock, which he undoes with his powers, and mentions that this crew, while not being the Deadly Six, are still warriors, adept ones at that. And this leads to what might be the most important conversation of this entire miniseries. With the entrance to the base now open, Starline begins to drive a semi through the front door, with Zavik hanging off the side. And the two have a quick back and forth. Zavik says he'll never understand the reliance Starline and Eggman have on machines, to which Starline says that they're efficient, tireless, and loyal. Traits he thought Zavik would hold in high regard. Which he does, sure, but it's at the cost of flexibility, passion, and ingenuity. Zavik thinks of robots as nothing more than tools. He has much more respect for strong warriors. Which retroactively kind of justifies why the Zeddy only had a mech here or there on Lost Hex before Eggman showed up. They have control over electromagnetic waves. They should be able to build a mechanical warship in a quarter of the time Eggie could, and have a much more nuanced command over these machines, but they largely choose not to. Yeah, they'll turn Eggman's weapons back on him, obviously, but they're not afraid to get their own hands dirty, Zavik especially, and we'll see more of that in a bit, but back to the conversation at hand. Starline retorts that he can build an army of thousands of robots in the same time it would take Zavik to find a dozen capable warriors, saying his robots won't disrespect you or ignore all your hard work or throw you away, kind of letting slip just how hurt he was by Eggman's betrayal. There's a brief moment of quiet that follows, where Starline realizes he may have potentially let slip a bit too much, and Zavik responds by saying he will never take you back. Starline says it's fine. After all, they're here for revenge. But Zavik continues by saying, more importantly, you don't need him. 
Hate on Zavik all you want, Sonic fans, but if you're dealing with a bad breakup, this is the homie you call. Remember, Starling fully intends to betray these guys, and while Zavik doesn't know exactly what his angle is, the Zeti knows this platypus is up to something. And while Starling keeps calling Zavs a brute and a beast behind his back, he is caught off guard by this comment. Zavik goes on to say that Starline's plans for the metal virus were solid. He only screwed up by trying to fix Eggman's mistakes. Starline tries to dismiss it, saying that he was only adding notes to Eggman's grand scheme, but Zavik tells him he's got great potential and shouldn't limit himself trying to become Eggman. He should surpass Eggman. Again, Zavik is suspicious. He doesn't actually know Starline's true intentions, which were to ultimately get Eggman back on track to conquer the world. While Zavik may not trust this guy, he is still a natural leader for a reason. Starline may be a genius, but Zavik can still read him like a book and offers him truly healthy advice. Maybe not healthy for the rest of the world, but on a personal level, this is the first time Starline begins to question his own motivations, and this is the beginning of sending him down a different path, which we will continue to explore as we carry on through the story. While they've made it through the gate, they still haven't actually entered the facility, and as they reach that door, Starline instructs Mimic to transform into Sonic and mock the nearest security camera. They intend to frame the hedgehog for all the damage, but as the octopus does this, he's greeted by a T-Rex robot. Look at this beautiful baby. I love this design. This looks like a proper Eggman boss fight. So much so that I swore I had seen this in a game before. Maybe not this one specifically, but did some digging and remembered that, yeah, there was the Ghost Rex from Sonic Rush Adventure. And as it turns out, this Rex's designer, Aaron Hammerstrom, said that this bot was based off Reds, that little dino badnik from the mobile port of Sonic 2. It looks like that little badnik, except digivolved into this design. Also, it's probably just reminding me of the T-Rex robot from Mega Man 7. But this particular one, it looks like it was pulled straight out of Sonic Heroes, even though it never had a T-Rex boss fight. I say it all the time, but I love how many of these new designs from the comic fit in so well that they sometimes make me think they might have come from the games themselves, because that was a rarity from the early days of Sonic comics. Anyway, yeah, back to the battle. Zavik moves in to take control, but discovers that this bot is EM shielded. I know they're doing this so they don't make things too easy for these characters, but Eggy being able to build bots that negate Zeddy powers is interesting. I'm not sure if they're going to play around with that anymore going down the road, but as Zavik has just got done saying, he does not put all his eggs in the robot basket. He's not useless without that power. Regardless, this Rex is actually going to be used to show off the worth of Rough and Tumble. As cool as the T-Rex robot is, it only lasts for two pages, as Tumble boots Rough into the Robo Rex's mouth, who then in turn lets off a gas bomb of his own natural making, taking the Rex down and impressing the rest of the team. They don't get many moments like this in the series itself, so it's cool to see how capable these two actually can be. And with the Rex now extinct, all that's left is cleanup. Starline begins to edit security footage, removing any trace of them being there and leaving the fake Sonic moments intact, all while the rest of the team begins loading up power cores into the truck. But Zavik takes a moment to pick one of them up, and clearly, there's a reaction. After everything's loaded up, they're good to go. But before they take their leave, Tumble and Zavik take a moment to make an impact in the front gate to replicate Sonic's spin dash. I also like this moment because it subtly tells you how strong Sonic actually is. It takes the two burly heavy hitters to get to make this kind of an impact, and it even leaves Tumble with a smarting hand. <laughs> Sometime later, we come across Eggman and Cubot surveying the aftermath. Cubot says things aren't looking great on the report, but clearly Sonic is to blame. But Eggman's not entirely convinced. Databases and chunks of security footage are missing. Cubot asks if that was done to cover Sonic's tracks, which Eggman then asks, why then would he mock the security camera? Cubot responds to say that maybe it's Tails trying to cover Sonic's tracks. And Eggy, despite his hatred of furries, says that Prower wouldn't be this sloppy. And I love that there's this unspoken respect for Sonic's sidekick in that. The point is, is that Eggman is not an idiot. He knows something is off, and he fully intends to get to the bottom of this. We go back to Starline's base, where the platypus is putting the final touches on a new device. Thinking over everything he spoke about with Zavik, admitting to himself that the Zeddy made a few good points. And normally, in a narrative like this, with a lead who has some 
something of a conscious, this might be the point where they realize they truly care about their team. But this is Starline. He dismisses all of that for now, saying that maybe this is something to think about down the road. But for now, things are going as planned. They raided the facility, stole a bunch of power cores, and now Starline has the power of speed, flight, and strength at his fingertips, as his warp topaz has now been replaced by the Tricor. We have not yet seen a single ring in the IDW series, but now we have power cores, which have only ever existed in Sonic Heroes. And now these things are part of the comic canon and are fully explained in a really cool way. And now a part of Starline's extending arsenal. But despite things seemingly going Starline's way as part two ends, as part three begins, we see just how many flaws he's overlooked. Issue 3 picks up with Starline logging into his computer and telling it to play back his last development journal. And yes, a recorded journal explaining all of your plan to betray this crew you put together is obviously a stupid move, but this genius has a big enough ego not to realize this fatal mistake. And just as the digital recording admits to all the betrayal stuff, Zavik steps out from the shadows as the real Starline is watching the screen. But plot twist, that's not the real Starline. It's Mimic, who tells Zavik he's been sneaking around looking for some intel and who can blame him it's not like starline's given him any reason to see him as a comrade he's been treating him like crap this whole time but again it's mimic i mean he's killed actual friends <laughs> zavik as we saw in the last issue never trusted the platypus from the start but he did confirm that starline was lying simply by touching a power core and that is another massive oversight i know he was trying to limit what they could do with the power cores but starline had to know that they were all going to be in close contact with the things any one of them could have picked them up at any time and speaking of the devices that's why Zavik is here. He wants to make sure Starline didn't booby trap them. So Mimic checks his notes and confirms they're not. It looked like Starline wanted to make sure his plan went without a hitch and would dispose of the team after everything was done. And the lack of a booby trap actually surprises Zavik. Says that Starline is just as short-sighted as Eggman. And that's all Mimic needs. He plans to kill Starline who is exposed and asleep in the same room. But Zavik stops him. They go outside and instead discuss a secondary plan as they still need Starline to access the Eggnet so they can get what they want. That only leaves Rough and Tumble without any intention of backstabbing anybody else. And we then cut to this cute little scene where they're all in the truck heading to the Ignite base, where we see the skunks trying to incorporate the rest of the team in their Team Rocket styled intro. I love that we get confirmation they actually prepare those rhymes. That is adorable. I love Zavik. Oh, look at his face. He's just seething. But he points out that this is a sign of a growing kinship and compliments Starline for getting them all together and having his plan go on without a hitch. All while thinking that Zavik is an idiot and can't wait to betray the guy. All this scheming upon scheming. <laughs> I love this stupid little scene. But they soon arrive at the Eggnet facility and Starline hands out the singular power core adapters. Zavik and Tumble get red strength cores, Mimic gets a yellow flight, and Ruff gets a blue speed one. Starline doesn't take one for himself, saying that he has no powers to enhance. And they get to work. Zavik instructs Mimic to join him in taking down the guard towers first, while Ruff and Tumble take care of the front door and once it topples starline once again walks right in like he owns the place they make short work of the defenses and tumble asks zavik why he doesn't bother to control the bots and zavik says it's much more satisfying to just obliterate them once again showing us that he's not fully reliant on robots and also showing us that weird ass mouth i ugh. i don't like that they're disconnected from his red spikes that should be his jaw I mean, why else are they there oh it's just it's very upsetting but yeah just like that they have reached the central computer. Starline bypasses the security while Mimic tells him to work fast. He'll like to scramble before Eggman is aware of their attack, which Starline says, oh, he's mobilizing now, which gives Mimic a heart attack. But Starline is quick to remind the murderous Squidward that they now have control of his information feed. And they're currently telling that feed that the attack is at a different facility. And again, that Sonic is to blame. The comic cuts over to Eggman's perspective where he is indeed mobilizing, but is once again thrown for a loop as Orbot comes in with a report with updated information. Eggy, again, doesn't have all the info on hand, but it's too big of a change to be a glitch. Be it from the original Eggnet base or this new updated base, there's potentially a dummy transmission going through. So Eggman decides he's just gonna bomb both locations. 
implications. Of course. Oblivious to the danger he's in on more than one front, Starline proceeds to take control of the defenses of the Eggnet base and confirms Egg Base Sigma. But at this point, Mimic holds a knife to his neck. Starline asks for help from their fearless leader who just stands there, and the skunks, confused at the situation, want to know what's going on. And Zavik explains what's really happening. So now Starline's entire crew are fully aware of his deception. And once they force him to delete any information on Mimic and pass control of all badniks in range to Zavik, he has now outlived his usefulness. And where issue 3 began with everything going Starline's way, it ends with everything unraveling. But all is not lost for Starline as he equips his Tricor and puts it to use against his former crew. Leaping out of harm's way, matching blows with Tumble, and speeding out of Zavik's violent grasp, he zooms off into the base. Even if under false pretenses, the Zeti is still in command as he instructs Mimic to stay behind in the computer room in case the platypus makes his way back, and then tells the skunks to join him on a hunt. Unfortunately for Zavik, his leadership isn't enough to sway Mimic from his selfish ways. Remember, this guy did betray his last team. <laughs> no reason he wouldn't do that here. He decides that Starline had a good point. Deleting Mimic's info won't mean squat if there are people alive that can snitch on him. So he uploads new information onto the Eggnet, sending a live feed of Zavik directly to Eggman, who responds to this exactly as you would imagine, redirecting his entire squadron onto the Eggnet base. And yes, that is the Egg Hawk from Sonic Heroes, and it was great to see it again. And technically, that's the first time we've actually seen him fly that thing, because that, that wasn't him in Heroes, so that's kind of cool. Back at the Eggnet base, Starline clotheslines a speeding skunk and immobilizes him with his toxin. But Ruff isn't as stupid as he seems, as he calls out to Tumble and Zavik, letting them know of Starline's location. The platypus takes to the hanging wires as Zavik walks in, and while he doesn't know exactly where Starline's at, he begins to talk trash, saying that Starline is not fit to be Eggman's successor, and discarding comrades was needlessly cruel. That was all compounded by his unearned sense of pride. And after saying all that out loud, Zavik pauses for a moment and realizes, never mind, all of that makes Starline exactly like Eggman. He may not have landed a hit physically, but Zavik's words once again Again, cut deep, and Starline ponders them as he speeds his way back to the computer room while taking Tumble out as he looks over a downed rough. He makes his way back to the computer while being concerned that Mimic might attack, not aware that the octopus has long since abandoned his post. But while he may no longer be there, Starline notices what Mimic has done and is now aware that Eggman is on his way to their location and will be there any moment. But while in front of the computer, Starline quickly finalizes his plans for Egg Base Sigma, converting its defenses to serve him and deleting it completely from Eggy's registry. Afterwards, he too takes his leave. Zavik comes across the fallen skunks, yelling at them for laying about, at which point they decide they don't really need to be bossed around by the Zeti, and they as well bail. Zavik, meanwhile, heads back to the computer room to see that Mimic is no longer there, leaving him the last man standing. But even though it's finally his turn to use the computer to track down the rest of the Deadly Six, he's rudely interrupted by Eggman. I love the interaction between these two. They just talk trash. Eggy has no intention of controlling any more Zeti. He wants to be rid of them as badly as the Sonic fanbase. Zavik is surprised that Eggman is so willing to sacrifice such a crucial base, but to nobody's surprise, Eggman's not too worried about it. He'll rebuild, and he thinks it's well worth the price of killing off Zavik while out of range of his powers. But Zavik tells him that he's a fool for thinking that he's out of reach, as he commands all the badniks now under his control to attack Eggy's fleet. And the two battle it out with badniks as the now disbanded bad guys look on from a distance, going their own separate ways. In the end, while Eggman is successful in tearing the base down around Zavik, the Zeti is sturdy, partially thanks to his power core, which falls apart as he pulls himself out of the rubble. He's worn out, but he's alive, off to track down the rest of the Deadly Six. Later on, Eggman reflects on everything, feeling that something is still missing about the odd raids as of late, not believing Zavik is savvy enough to pull off a stunt like this. He isn't 
sure who or what is making moves against him, but he's sure they are. All right, so I did call this guy a smarty pants earlier, and I know he probably has a lot of enemies, like more than the reader may be aware of, but I don't know how Starline isn't the first person he thinks of. Like, obviously, he has a vendetta and knowledge of how things are run in the Eggman Empire. I suppose you could say that Eggman was just that dismissive of the guy, but again, he's supposed to be a super genius. But hey, the dude is spinning a lot of plates, so much to the point that he doesn't notice an entire facility is no longer under his control. This series has established Eggman to be quick to dismiss old projects and move on to something new without a second thought. So that tracks. As chaotic as things got, as many mistakes as he's made, Starline ultimately got what he wanted. And while the crew is now out there doing their own thing and now enemies of the platypus, Zavik's words did inspire him. He went into this with the intention of helping Eggman in his own twisted way, but now Starline does not want to bolster Eggman, he wants to surpass him. And we end the series with Starline on his very own throne. And that wraps things up, guys. Like the Tangle Whisper miniseries, the first time I read this, I felt like not much happened. Like all this probably could have been done in a single issue or two. And also, I was a little confused as to what exactly was happening. Like for a moment, I thought they were invading Egg Base Sigma, and then it was destroyed, and then it was suddenly back. So it turns out Egg Base Smegma was only there to bookend the series. We only saw it at the beginning and the end. Like I said, I think I just read through this a bit too quick that first time around, and I was left somewhat unsatisfied, feeling like nothing really Really major happened here, but that's not exactly true. In some weird ways, there was a bit of a character arc, and at times, kind of anti-character arcs. Rough and Tumble are free again, and I know they were at the end of the Metal Virus, so it's no major deal there. Like, without the story, it really would not have changed anything for them. We only knew they were in jail because of the beginning of this book. But that said, they were at their most competent and most enjoyable in this miniseries, and that's probably because we don't follow them as antagonists. It's fun to see them interact with people they can consider allies. The Mimic was nice to see again, but I'll be honest, I felt he was the least engaging of the crew. He does serve a purpose here, but he's nowhere near as creepy when we view him from this angle. But to be fair, he lost that particular trait before we even wrapped up the story he was introduced in. Other than that, he's not given too much to do, but he was still fun to watch all the same, and I'm glad he's active again. And Zavik once again surprises me. He proves to me that there's no such thing as a bad Sonic character. You just give him to a good writer and you're going to get a good story. He's so much better to find than he has any right to be. This is why I'm happy to know that Ian Flynn is writing the next Sonic game. As long as he's given some freedom to flesh out some of these characters, he can even make the infamous Zeddy a compelling villain. Always intimidating, but always plotting. The juxtaposition between his beast-like violence and elegant composure was something that Flynn wanted to capture, and I think he did a great job interpreting this guy in such a way. He could rip off Starline's head the moment he knew the platypus was betraying him, but instead he schemes. He waits for the right moment to unleash that terrifying fury. I think I need to finally admit it. Ian Flynn has made this a good character. Zavik is redeemed. I like reading about him in the IDW series. Never thought I would be saying that, but here we are. What a time to be alive. I'm really excited to check out his Archie run. He turned me around on a lot of American characters, but that's for another time. As for Starline himself, he's really what I'm talking about when there's something of a character arc, or again, anti-character arc. See, none of these guys actually change throughout the story. They're selfish, violent jerks at the beginning of the story. They're selfish, violent jerks at the end of the story. And any camaraderie that was being built is completely demolished. We get glimpses of humanity here and there, but ultimately Starline always doubles down on his selfish choice. And his great takeaway from all of this is that he deserves more. He is better than his idol. He just doubles down on his arrogance. There are a few occasions in this story where you would traditionally see a cast come together or see a more selfish lead, learn a bit of empathy and compassion. But every time you think that's going to happen, there's always an undertone of deception or you'll see Starline zig where a hero would zag. He doesn't have a traditional character arc. And honestly, why should he? Sure, things got screwy, but again, he got what he wanted, and 
why would he do anything differently? Same goes for the rest of them. Savik's a little beaten up, but he is out of prison. They all are. And Mimic is now out of the Eggnet database. The series justifies them being jerks. Like I said up front, this miniseries wasn't lying with that name. These are bad guys. And by the end of it, the main character is now a badder guy. He's graduated from being a sidekick and now is a full-on villain in his own right. And we're going to see more from him, and actually Zavik, very soon. And I'll be honest, I can't wait. I'm glad I read through this a second time for this video. There's a lot more here to pick apart than I initially gave it credit for. I always got to remember that this is an ongoing story, one that keeps building off each issue. And sometimes it's just fun to watch bad guys be bad guys. And it reminded me a lot of that Sonic Universe series, which was a lot of fun when it was still running. A lovely reminder that there's more than just Sonic in these stories. And even if they are newer characters, morally reprehensible ones at that, there are still engaging tales that deserve to be told. But with that, it's time for us to bring this video to an end. Thank you all for watching. I greatly appreciate it. We, of course, will be talking about the other stuff from IDW soon, but I am going to be kicking off the Archie stuff in the very near future as well. So be sure you stick around for that. Going to be producing a few of these episodes. I'm going to get them up quick for my patrons, all while I work on some more game related videos. So if you haven't yet subscribed, please be sure you do. We got a lot of fun stuff coming up and already have a bunch of stuff you can go check out right now. But speaking of patrons, of course, I have to thank you guys so much for chipping in for this crazy ass project. This is now my full time job and I largely rely on YouTube ad revenue and help from my patrons. Thank you guys so much. And I of course need to give an extra special shout out to those who pitch in a little bit extra. That includes Kyle Winter, Cirrus the Skeptic, Joseph Duncan Sonic 2 Blue, John, Casey Moore, Paisan Razul, Xanderoni the Painter, Trey Nobles, Hatsworth, Nick S, Tristan Trap, Meekers, Dun Dun, Miles the Prower, Jeremy Singer, Mr. Bouje, Rain, Sam Webster, Dwight Graham, Fish Flop, Lucas Lipker, The Bad Pal, Shodan, Mr. SP, Cecil the Glade, The Dark Neon, Missing No, Stefan Plakonica, Three Monic, Graham J. Hall, Leonard X, Wayne is Boss, Jamie Chevalier, Lederick, 64 Bits, David 20 Cover Your Face, Ryan Rolfs, The Lumberjack, Otis Small, ya boy, Shifting Flesh, Mute, Trash Baphomet, Autumn from Twitter.com, SSG Infinite Sonic, That Pyra Main, and Mui Saxi. <laughs> That's the first time I read that. <laughs> that caught me off guard. <laughs> I swear I can make a poker app out of all these names. Guys, thank you so much for your support. It means the world to me. It means my livelihood, if I'm honest. You guys are the absolute best. But I've been recording for over an hour now, and my throat is just torn apart, so I'm going to get going. Toot toot, Sonic Warriors. 